All right, folks, why don't we go ahead and get started? Uh, it's about 1 o'clock, and we've got a lot of material to cover. My name's Amal Matu, and uh, I work at University of Maryland in Baltimore, so I bring you some greetings from the folks in Baltimore. I um, hope you all are, uh, are doing well. How many of you have been to Baltimore before? All right, great. It's a lovely city. Downtown Inner Harbor is a great place to be. And although it's been awfully hot, and many of you, I'm sure, I'm coming from areas where they're having heat waves. We have about 100 degrees with terrible humidity. So it's kind of nice to be here in the dry heat, right? Because dry heat's not the same, apparently. So great seafood out in Baltimore. So if you love seafood, come out and visit. Uh, I'm sure many of you are feeling a little bit like this uh, after lunch and uh, on a day when we're doing board review. Board review usually is not the most exciting stuff in the world, but we'll try to keep it light as we go. There's a lot of material to cover. I'm going to start out with the summary slide of my entire two and a half hours today. And this also applies to my two hours on GI tomorrow. And it applies actually to the entire course. The, the slide up here says, he couldn't find a thing wrong with me, the quack. So it's a woman who is uh, being presented on a board exam. And uh, the physician made the mistake of saying there's nothing wrong. So please remember that on this board exam, and for anybody who might be here in preparation for the oral boards, this is even more appropriate. Every patient you see, just assume that that person's about to die. All right? I think maintaining a really healthy degree of paranoia is very, very important, especially when it comes to cardiology related topics. If you've got a patient who's having a little bit of queasiness, they're having a STEMI. A little bit of low back pain after lifting some furniture, rupture AAA, right? Somebody's got some flu symptoms, it's anthrax, all right? Stable vitals, they're actually in occult shock, okay? So you've got to assume that these patients are really, really sick. Reflux will never be a correct answer on the board exam, all right? Renal colic in an elderly person, might as well just plan to take the boards again the following year, okay? And what else? Um, viral syndrome or flu in a kid who's got a fever. It doesn't happen at ABEM General Hospital. I'm telling you, if they present uh, Mr. Jones, who's 65 years old, and he's got epigastric burning, radiating to his throat with belching dyspepsia, he's burping a lot, it all started after some jambalaya. He lays back, it feels worse. He sits up, it feels a lot better, and he takes some Maalox and it goes away. Diagnosis is STEMI, okay? <laughs> So just have a healthy degree of paranoia as you go through all of the, uh, the, um, the, the lectures. A few words uh, to start with. The, the slides that you'll notice, I think, in all of the lectures are very crowded. And the reason that we do that is because we expect people are going to be using the slides as the handout. So we put extra information on the slides. And as we go through this, since there is a lot of material, I'm going to skip over some small parts. And what I've tried to do is highlight in red and underline anything that I think represents extra high risk for showing up on the board exam. Back when I first started doing this, I'd, I'd just do red highlighting, and then somebody came up and complained that they were colorblind and they couldn't see what was red. Um, and it never occurred to me. So now what I've done is I've underlined key points also. So anything on the slides that you see red and underline, what I, want, what I would like you to do is just circle it in your handout because that, in my opinion, represents extra high likelihood, high risk for showing up on the board exam. Anytime somebody says the most common cause of this or most common cause of that, they love to ask most common type of questions to pay special attention to that. Uh, triads and quadrads of anything make for great and easy board questions. Uh, ACLS, I'm not gonna go through ACLS in any detail. We'll touch on some parts of it, but the assumption is that everybody here is knowing uh, ACLS, PALS, ATLS, and, and I think uh, with all the problems that those courses may have, they still represent fair game and high risk for showing up on the board. So please do review the protocols. ACLS become very easy, right? All you gotta do is push hard, push fast, and, and then cool them afterwards. So we, we, great, we just covered ACLS 2000, actually. Um, and always consider the deadly causes first, okay? Uh, and in fact, um, before we even get into cardiology, for example, when we talk about chest pain in this lecture, on, you know, in real life, how many different causes of chest pain are there? It's like 50. You look it up in Tintin Alley Rose, there's a whole page. On the boards, six causes of chest pain. That's it. All right? There's ACS, dissection, PE, pericarditis, slash tamponade, all right? Tension pneumo, and Boerhaave's. That's it. That's all the things that cause chest pain on the boards. Please don't forget Boerhaave's. Okay, 
Um, I've seen Borhoff's probably about 12 times in my career. 11 were on board exams, okay? <laughs> so, <clears throat> you know, the, the ABEM General Hospital, the people that live around that hospital is a very, very unusual population. They're all retching, vomiting alcoholics that have multiple allergies to Toradol and Motrin, and, um, and most of them are in their third trimester of pregnancy. They were just in an MVA and the Jehovah's Witnesses um, in this population. So you've got to know those type of uh, scenarios and know what to do. And I'm not even joking about the Jehovah's Witness. Um, I think Kevin's going to cover some of the medical legal stuff. So make sure you know about that. But again, think about high, high risk with everything. So we'll start with acute coronary syndrome. You'll notice nothing on this slide is highlighted. This is a lot of this is just basic, just to get us kind of warmed up. So uh, ACS, acute coronary syndrome, includes everything from what we used to call unstable angina to non-Q-wave MI to Q-wave MI. Um, it includes people, now we call them ischemia, and it includes non-STEMIs and STEMIs. So it's just anybody with uh, coronary disease who is symptomatic in some way, all right? Um, and uh, there's gonna be a lot of questions on the boards because this is very common in our clinical practice and in real life. In terms of pathophys, again, no big secrets here. This is usually due to atherosclerosis. We'll talk about non-atherosclerotic causes in just a moment. Usually there's a fixed lesions, there's plaque disruption, the plaque ruptures, there's, platelet, there's bleeding within the, the, the plaque, there's platelet aggregation, thrombus formation. And because of the occlusion in the artery, myocardial oxygen demand exceeds the oxygen supply and they develop symptoms. If it's a complete occlusion, they infarct, those are the Q wave MIs or the positive enzymes or the STEMIs and uh, you don't necessarily have to have a complete occlusion, you just develop chest pain. Those are what we traditionally would call the unstable anginas, all right? Well, this slide has a bunch of non-atherosclerotic causes of ACS, and although I didn't highlight anything, it's probably a good idea just to be aware that not everyone who has an MI is having the classic ruptured plaque and, and thrombus formation. Trauma can induce an MI, connective tissue diseases, vasculitis, metabolic problems, congenital, uh, thrombi from TTP, DIC, embolic causes, all right? Thoracic dissection, we'll talk more about, four to eight percent of dissection patients will present not only dissecting, but they'll also present with this, uh, an MI. Um, this is Kevin's slide, crack, crack cocaine can induce MIs as well, and in fact, infectious diseases can produce MI uh, as well. Now, there's a handful of LLS, actually a lot of LLSA readings uh, over the, uh, the past, I don't know how many years it's been going on now, 10 years or so. Um, this is one of the articles, classic article, and I think there's probably only one thing that you need to know from that article. We've already said that you need to know that cocaine can induce an MI, but from this particular article, please remember this number, 6%. And this is one of the few numbers that's worth remembering because it seems to pop up as 6% in every study on cocaine chest pain. 6% of people that present with chest pain immediately after using cocaine will end up ruling in, right? All the rest of the stuff in the article is, is pathophys and stuff that you probably know already. But please do remember that 6%, thus it's highlighted. All right, ACS we talked about, it spans the spectrum of unstable angina all the way through non-STEMI and STEMI. Unstable angina, again, no surprises here. This includes resting uh, patients that develop angina at rest, new onset angina, if they have crescendo or increasing symptoms, uh, increasing severity. These are patients that are at high risk for death or MI, and you can't rely on the troponins, right? Everybody should hopefully know that troponins classically are negative in unstable angina because they haven't infarcted yet. They infarct a couple of days later or a week later. So that's why we admit these patients. And there's a couple of types of non-STEMI ACS uh, that are variants. Um, an older term, Prince Metals angina, which we oftentimes just call coronary vasospasm. This is not a true ruptured plaque. It's, a, it's essentially vasospasm within the coronary arteries, and these patients can present with diffuse ST elevation in more than one anatomic area, so you can have inferior plus anterior plus lateral diffuse ST elevation. Generally, there's no reciprocal depression with Prince Metal's angina, all right? It's worth knowing about this coronary spasm, yet, um, personally, I don't think we even need to teach about it because 
practically speaking, when these patients show up in the emergency department, you're gonna do everything just like a true STEMI. Send them to the cath lab, give them lytics, and then you find out that it was just spasm retrospectively, so it's not really relevant to us, but nevertheless, they may ask you a question about Prince Metal's angina, and that's just diffuse uh, coronary vasospasm, and classically, there are no reciprocal ST depressions with Prince Metal's angina, all right? Um, there may be no coronary disease at all. And then classifications, no big deal here, STEMI or older term Q wave MI, this is a transmural infarction, typically non-STEMI or an older term non-Q wave MI, the subendocardial infarction with partial wall thickness. A key point here that's worth knowing is that when you look at the prognosis between true STEMIs and the non-STEMIs, there's probably not much difference at all. In fact, there's some studies that say the non-Q wave MIs may have a worse long-term prognosis there's different theories about that, not related to the boards, what you need to know, but it may be that they're not treated as aggressively. Whatever the cause may be, the key point here is very simple. Non-Q wave MIs are not associated with a better long-term prognosis, right? So you need, or non-STEMIs, or, or don't necessarily have a better prognosis. Okay, EKG abnormality. We're gonna talk a lot more about EKGs a little bit later on, but again, I've highlighted what's on this slide, and this makes for a classic type of question also. They may ask you, what's the first thing that you encounter in the presence of uh, an inf a STEMI, okay? The EKG portion that you have on the left right here, this is normal, asymptomatic, all right? When the person develops the initial phase of ischemia and infarction, they develop hyperacute T waves. You'll notice V1, V2, and V3, the T waves have gotten broader and taller. These are not hyperkalemia T waves, which are narrow and tall. These are broad-based and tall. We refer to these as hyperacute T waves. If they give you, give you a question and say, what's the first thing you see, is generally they want you to pick out hyperacute T waves. It's just broad-based and then tall T waves. And then a little while later, then you go on to develop the ST segment elevation and the T waves may start to flip. The main purpose of this slide, hyperacute T waves. And also the first thing I put up here, please remember that at least 4% of people having an MI, even with pain, can have an initially completely rock solid normal EKG. So the normal EKG on the boards and in real life doesn't rule out infarction. You can still be infarcting even with that initially normal EKG. If you do serial EKGs, you pick up a few more, but the EKG is not a perfect test. Hurts me to say that, but nevertheless it's true, okay? Um, all right, a little bit more about EKGs in this section. ST segment changes, we look for one millimeter of elevation in two contiguous leads. Probably 10, 15 years ago, people used to say, well, it's gotta be two millimeters in the anterior leads, one millimeter in the limb leads, and now the guidelines simply say, if you have one millimeter of ST elevation in two contiguous leads, then you need to worry that that person's infarcting. Um, and usually the elevation corresponds to the area of infarction. If you have a new left bundle branch block on the 2012 boards, a new left bundle branch block also is a person who's gonna get lytics or needs to go to the cath lab. That may change in the future, but for the purposes of the boards, new left bundle is part of the guidelines that person gets cath or gets lytics. <clears throat> And if you develop reciprocal depression, we're not talking about bundles here, but if you develop reciprocal depression in other areas, we refer to that as reciprocal depression, that increases the specificity that the elevation truly is an MI, and it also worsens the prognosis. So ST elevation MI with reciprocal changes has a worse prognosis than ST elevation without reciprocal changes. It also has higher specificity. Now, one of the LLSA articles that we had to read uh, focused on disinformation, EKG changes in STEMI, and one of the interesting points that I've highlighted here, because I don't think it's common teaching, and something that I never knew until reading this, is that if a person's having a, a, an MI and the T waves flip, they invert within the first four hours, that's actually a good prognostic sign. Okay, and in fact, if you have a STEMI, you give lytics to that patient and you see the T waves invert in the first few hours, that's one of the indicators that your lytics have worked, that the patient's starting to reperfuse, right? If the T waves invert beyond four hours, you can't make any conclusions, but if they invert within the first four hours, that's considered a good prognostic sign, right? And then the last point here from that article, significant Q waves, are at least one little box wide. If they're skinnier than that, they're not considered infarction Q waves. 
generally about one third the height of the R wave. And um, back when I was in residency, we were taught that Q waves take about six or eight hours to develop. What we now know is that Q waves can start developing within a couple of hours. So Q waves do start developing fairly early on, all right? And this slide is just a summary of the different ways that the EKG can be useful in an MI. <clears throat> It'll tell you who needs emergent reperfusion, emergent reperfusion meaning lytics or immediate cath, PCI. It can identify the infarct-related artery, right coronary, left main, LAD. Uh, it can predict the amount of myocardium at risk. It can also indicate reperfusion. After you give the lytics, there's a few things to look for in the EKG that indicate that the artery has opened up in response to the lytics. We've got another slide where we'll talk about that in a second. All right? And also to look for complications of the MI, dyspnea and conduction issues. How many people here give lytics when you see STEMIs in your practice? All right, raise your hands up high, be proud. That's, all, that's quite a few actually. Worldwide, still the most common form of reperfusion therapy. You know, in big cities, cath is everywhere. ABEM General Hospital, I promise you, the cath lab is always down. Okay, so you are going to need to give lytics on the board exam and definitely on the oral board exam. The cardiologists and cath team are snowed in. They can't make it there. So you better be ready to give lytics on the board exam. So when we talk about acute reperfusion on the board exam, they still want emergency physicians to have the guts to give lytics. And so this, this stuff is, is going to be very important. Now, who gets lytics? Who, who needs emergent reperfusion therapy? Patient comes in, and the first thing they have to have is concerning symptoms, all right? Usually chest pain, but it can be an older person who's got shortness of breath and diaphoresis, and so it doesn't have to just be chest pain, concerning symptoms. So first thing, they have to be symptomatic with concerning symptoms. And then, secondly, they have to have an EKG that qualifies as a STEMI. What are the EKG criteria that qualify as a STEMI? Well, ST elevation, in two contiguous leads of at least one millimeter elevation, right? A new left bundle branch block, or third, an old left bundle that now has Scarbosa criteria. And this is part of the readings that we've had to do, and I believe that this is very, very much fair game.